It was a radiant Friday evening on June 22, 1951, in Miami. The city pulsed with a lively energy. The heat mingled with the ocean breeze, and the streets bustled with people savouring the beauty of a summer night. As we lounged, watching the world roll by, a nearby copy of the Miami Herald caught our attention. Its headlines captured a world in flux. Empires had crumbled, and new powers were rising in their wake. America, victorious after the Second World War, was poised to lead. Old European empires that once dominated the globe, like Britain and France, were receding. The British Empire, once so vast that the sun never set on its reach, was releasing its grip. India, now split into three, stood free, and Africa's countries began slipping from colonial hands. In this reshaped world, two titanic forces now stood on opposing sides, battling not with bombs and tanks, but with ideology. On one side was communist Russia, extending its iron hand over Eastern Europe, Asia, South America and Africa, seizing influence in an aggressive push. On the other side stood America, cloaked in the mantle of freedom, a defender of democracy, determined to protect liberty across the globe. Though this global confrontation would come to be known as the Cold War, it also sparked another war, one that festered in the shadows, the war on organized crime. At the forefront of this new crusade was Senator Kefauver. Tireless and relentless, he swept across the country, dragging America's most notorious gangsters into the public eye. His hearings exposed the true scale of organized crime and lifted the veil on a dark underworld that had profited immensely from prohibition. The same figures who had built empires on bootlegged liquor, Irish, Jewish and Italian mobsters, had now shifted their sights to gambling, unions and entertainment. Their wealth grew hand in hand with America's expansion, their influence burrowing into politics, unions, even intelligence agencies. They were the architects of a sprawling network that reached from America to Africa, South Asia and South America. And they served a dual role, partnering with the US government when it suited them and fostering an empire of shadows when it didn't. But Kefauver's inquiry pulled back the curtain. First, the spotlight hit gambling, and soon every major gangster felt its unforgiving glare. Figures like Frank Costello, Maya Lansky, and Willie Moretti found themselves under cross-examination. We remember Costello, the Prime Minister of the Underworld, refusing to speak. A mobster who boldly turned his back on the committee's questions. Lansky too stood under the lights, a master of secrecy, unyielding in his code. And Moretti, his words unforgettable, faced the inquiry with an air that hinted at the weight of his secrets. The inquiry went beyond the mobsters themselves. Families, blood relatives, trusted with the utmost secrets, were caught in the dragnet. In the Sicilian Mafia, it wasn't just loyalty that forged bonds, it was blood. Al Capone's empire, for instance, was tightly knit with cousins and kin. As the syndicates grew, more formidable leaders took the helm, particularly in Chicago, where they didn't just choose bosses based on loyalty, they chose the highest earners, the political puppeteers. Men like Tony Accardo and Paul Rica weren't just gangsters. They were master strategists with connections stretching to New York, New Orleans and Florida. Accardo's brother, Martin, was one such trusted relative. Respected and deeply involved in the family's operations, he found himself in a harsh spotlight in 1951. That day, the Miami Herald reported on Martin Accardo, his associates, and even his wife, who had gone on record to testify about the depth of Martin's influence in the Chicago outfit and the political puppets he held under his sway. This glimpse into the mob world wasn't just about the men in charge. It was about their families, who bore the consequences of their actions, often unwillingly, as the government's gaze fixed on anyone connected to the syndicates. The key forver hearings were only the beginning. When the Kennedy administration took office, the pressure would intensify. Mobsters who had once been untouchable found their relatives facing deportation, 
their families divided by the relentless hunt for justice. The war on organized crime would tear into the lives of these kingmakers, who once ruled with an iron fist, and force the mobsters to watch as the empires they had built began to crack under the scrutiny of a nation determined to eradicate their influence. In a tense and often absurd display of defiance, Martin Leo Accardo, brother of notorious Chicago mob boss Tony Accardo, faced a Senate committee probing organized crime. Despite his evasive responses and unwavering stance on his constitutional rights, Accardo's criminal ties to the infamous Capone Empire were laid bare. The committee, pressing him with questions about his involvement in interstate crime, encountered only stonewalling from Accardo, who refused to answer even the simplest questions. His contemptuous attitude pushed the committee to the brink, setting the stage for a potential contempt citation in a hearing marked by both humour and hostility. Martin Leo Accardo, a sour-visaged hoodlum who deserted the gambling halls of Cicero, Illinois, for the sunny climbs of Coral Gables, became the first candidate for a contempt citation on Thursday. The brother of Tony Accardo, the infamous head of the Chicago mob and successor to Al Capone's old empire, Martin Leo Accardo is perhaps less well known than his brother, but still holds a clear cut tie to powerful criminal networks. Accardo's criminal record, cited during Thursday's hearing, showed a conviction in the liquor racket during Prohibition, when he was sentenced to four and a half years in the federal prison at Leavenworth. His record also indicated that he later served as cashier for the Capone gang's gambling interests. Though he owned a home in Coral Gables, he spent little time there due to constant visits from the police, who kept a close watch after he was required to register as a convicted felon. During his brief seven-minute appearance, Accardo persistently repeated, I decline to answer the question on the ground that it may tend to incriminate me. At the end of his appearance, he had the line down so well he no longer needed to refer to the small scrap of paper he held in his hands as he walked through the audience to the witness chair. His refusal to answer began when Associate Counsel Downey Rice asked him his address. I have a statement, Accardo replied, which brought a wave of laughter from the audience. Rice repeated the question, but Accardo persisted, saying, I stand on my constitutional right. At this point, Chairman Herbert O'Connor had to caution Accardo. The absurdity reached new heights when Accardo refused to answer a question from Rice about what was written on the paper in his hand. I decline, said Accardo. The committee directed him to answer, but Accardo remained firm in his refusal. Chief Counsel Richard Moser intervened, asking, Have you heard the questions directed to you? Counsel repeatedly asked, if his refusal was based on the grounds that his answers might incriminate him, concerning a federal or state crime. Accardo finally admitted, Both. O'Connor then launched a series of questions at him, to which Accardo, expressionless and unwavering, kept chanting, I decline to answer. These questions included, Do you understand the question? Did the offence you have in mind occur more than ten years ago? Did it occur more than three years ago? Where were you born? How old are you? Do you have any information about crime in interstate commerce as it relates to other individuals? Have you read about crime in interstate commerce in the newspapers? Are you married, Mr. Ricardo? The audience chuckled when he refused to answer whether he was married. Finally, Senator O'Connor stated, the subcommittee is definitely of the opinion that the witness is in contempt. He has shown a flagrant disregard for the rights and duties of the Senate Crime Committee. We will recommend to the full committee that the witness be cited for contempt. This article, originally published on June 22, 1951, unfolds with a gripping account of the ongoing Senate Crime Committee hearings, where the testimony of a former mob wife unveils the tangled financial web behind Harry Toyler's pro-gambling Morning Mail newspaper. In stark contrast to Toyler's statements, she reveals that a significant portion of the funding came from Martin Accardo, notorious brother of Tony Accardo, 
Al Capone's reputed successor. Her bold claims of perjury and insight into mob influence over Miami's media and gambling scene add layers of intrigue, pulling readers deeper into a world of corruption and organized crime's reach into public life. In calm and carefully chosen words, a pretty blonde divorcee put the finger on Harry Toyler on Thursday, revealing the truth about the money that backed his pro-gambling and now-defunct Morning Mail newspaper. Directly contradicting the statements made by Toyler himself, who preceded her on the witness stand at the reopening of the Senate Crime Committee hearings. She testified that $100,000 of the money came from Martin Accardo, the brother of Tony Accardo, the number one heir to Al Capone's hoodlum empire. The attractive witness implied that she spoke with a level of authority on Martin's financial dealings, as she was his wife at the time. She is now married to former Miami policeman Dallas Carroll, who escorted her to the stand and insisted that television cameras be turned off. She even brought Tony's name into the story, stating that in her presence, Toyler and Martin discussed the male's low advertising revenue. According to her, Toyler suggested they approach Tony to see if he could apply a little pressure on local movie theatres and nightclubs to buy ads. She admitted that she did not know what, if anything, came of that suggestion. However, Tony was likely in a position to grant such a favour, given his close ties to Louis Little New York Campagna and Paul the Waiter Rika, both of whom were central figures in the Willie Beoff George Brown scandal, involving control over the movie operators' union. Mrs. Carroll testified that Tony had connections with the union. She then branded as false Toiler's statement that he signed and gave a promissory note to Martin Accardo, which had been introduced as evidence, but that he never received any money for it. The committee's associate counsel, Downey Rice, asked the former Mrs. Accardo, was that perjured testimony? Every word of it, she declared firmly. In response to another question about Toyler's statement, she added, Every word that he said regarding that paper is absolutely false. Every word of it. In the afternoon session, Toyler countered Mrs. Carroll's perjury charge with a telegram to the committee, stating, Either she or I will be guilty of perjury and requesting to be recalled for further testimony. The message was entered into the record, and the ex-publisher was then brought back to the stand. This was the message the senator read. Mrs. Orita Yelverton Carroll has made statements concerning me. I urgently request permission to appear before the committee to explain my side of this matter as soon as possible. Either she or I will be guilty of perjury, and I insist that whoever that person may be ought to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. This telegram is not only being sent to you, but also to the Associated Press, United Press and International News Service, so that the public is aware that perjury has been committed and that the culprit should be punished. I hope you will recall me immediately before you end this session. The ensuing questioning of Toyler about whether he was accusing Mrs. Carroll of perjury continued for several minutes before Toyler finally stated firmly that he believed that woman's imagination and memory have completely broken down. At another point, in questioning by Chief Counsel Richard Moser and Rice, Mrs. Carroll said, That was money that should have gone into a trust fund for our two children. In his earlier testimony, Toiler, immaculately dressed in white linen and wearing large horn-rimmed spectacles, admitted to borrowing $7,500 from Charlie Friedman, a member of the Miami Beach S&G Gambling Syndicate, while his newspaper was struggling. He denied, however, that he had borrowed money from Murray the Camel Humphreys, another heir to the old Capone racket empire. Mrs. Carroll testified that she had heard Toyler and her then-husband discussing the possibility of such a loan, although she did not know whether it had ever been finalised. Mrs. Carroll smiled behind her dark glasses when commenting on another part of Toyler's testimony. This was the part where Toyler had been vague in identifying Martin Accardo and Leo Martin as the same person, only saying, I do know a man named Leo Martin, who may be 
Martin Accardo. This statement was made before the promissory note had been introduced as evidence. Mrs. Carroll shook her heavy green earrings and smiled as she explained that there was no doubt among Accardo's acquaintances that the two were indeed the same person. By way of explaining the note, Toiler said he signed it as something to bind their loan agreement, but insisted it was not to become effective until $50,000 worth of stock was put up as collateral. He claimed that this stock was never provided, so the deal did not proceed. Mrs. Carroll testified that her husband typically kept two guns around the house, a big one and a small pearl-handled one. Rice produced some expectant looks among City Hall employees when he presented a photostatic copy of a gun registration certificate that Ocado had secured from the City of Miami on October 31, 1949. A check confirmed that Ocado stated he needed a gun to protect his Coral Gables home, or so he had told the clerk at a store on East Flagler Street, where he purchased a short-barreled detective special on October 28, 1949. Police Chief Walter Headley retrieved gun registration records to examine one of Ocado's firearms, revealing that a 38 calibre Colt was purchased from John the Magic Man, located at 300 East Flagler Street. This store was operated by L.F. John, a former special investigator for Leslie Quigg, ex-police chief and city commissioner. Headley explained that registration was required under a city ordinance mandating that gun sellers notify the police of all sales, although no pre-purchase checks on buyers were conducted. Miami had previously enforced a law requiring such checks, but it was repealed after police found that most gun purchasers were going to neighboring areas where no application was required. Headley also noted that Ocado was never granted a permit to carry a gun. The blonde witness easily identified a group photograph of herself and her husband, taken at the opening of the morning mail. At first, I did not know Mr. Toiler or anything about his policies, she said, but it didn't take long to find out. When asked what she meant by policies, she smiled and replied, about gambling and things like that. She also described Toiler's Welcome to Frank Costello editorial, in which Costello, a nationally recognized gambler, was portrayed as a public benefactor, as very foolish. Subpoenaed under the name Orita Yelverton Carroll, the witness said she had married Ocado in 1944 while working at the Circle Club in Cicero, Illinois, a gambling establishment he operated. She admitted that the club catered to a who's who of gangdom. She declined to name individuals, but confirmed their presence when Moser read out a list, responding, Yes, they all came in at times. The names read to Mrs. Carroll included Jake, Greasy Thumb, Guzik, Tony Accardo, Martin Accardo, Joe Fischetti, Robert Fischetti, Matthew Capone and his wife, and Tony Consentino. During his own testimony, Toiler fluctuated between attempting cooperation and displaying a sharp attitude. He began by stating that he did not want to take advantage of the old constitutional rights dodge, which he described as now famous. He admitted that 34 years ago he had served four years in prison after being convicted on armed robbery charges. He mentioned that he currently had a $300,000 libel suit pending against the Miami Daily News and requested that the committee avoid questions that might compromise his case. This request was not entirely honored. Moser delved into Toiler's other arrests, including one in California in 1933, on suspicion of murder. Toiler explained that he had been kidnapped in Hollywood, California, and taken to Burbank at the order of a district attorney, but was later cleared and released. He accused Moser of attempting to prevent him from explaining that, although he had been arrested multiple times, he had always been freed. Senator Herbert R. O'Connor, head of the committee, assured him that no such intent existed on the part of the investigators. Moser then referred to a case in 1934 
when Toyler was arrested in Florida for California authorities on another robbery charge. Toyler noted that the governor of Florida refused to extradite me. In a similar case in 1937, he recalled that Governor Fred Cohn had signed extradition papers, sending him back to California. He admitted that this may have been in connection with a robbery. When Moser asked if May West had been the robbery victim, Toyler responded, It could have been. He then demanded that the records reflect that the charges were dropped and he was freed. Toyler claimed that when he first arrived in Miami in 1933, he worked as a newsboy. Committee counsel indicated they had been thoroughly investigating his financial progress since that time. They questioned him closely about his income tax returns, clearly referencing documents in their possession. Toyler was asked to explain how he afforded a $100 per month apartment in 1950 when his income tax showed only $900 in earnings. He replied that he had relied on capital for his living expenses and noted that county records would show he had mortgaged many of his assets. The questioning then shifted to his Palm Court Hotel. He was asked directly, Did you rent a room for gambling? Toyler replied that the case was still pending in court. Moser introduced records indicating that twelve telephones had been removed by arresting officers during the raid. When asked if his tenant, Friedman, was a member of the S&G syndicate, Toyler responded, I wouldn't know. Checks were then presented, related to a benefit party, held for a group supporting Barry College. Toyler stated that he had paid for a large dinner on that occasion, and William Burbridge, a Miami Beach City councilman, had been co-chairman with him. Moser indicated that cancelled checks showed the S&G syndicate had paid $6,000 for the event and questioned why a gambling syndicate would be interested in a college benefit. Toyler said he did not know. The questioning next focused on an incident at Hampshire House, a New York hotel. Toyler admitted he had stayed there as a guest of Sam Cohen, another S&G syndicate member. He explained that upon his arrival, he found the hotel fully booked but Cohen had a spare room and covered the cost of his stay. When asked why he had not signed the application for a liquor license for the Palm Court in his wife's name, Toyler retorted, You know why, and I know why you asked the question. If you want to refer to me again as an ex-convict and keep on referring to me as that, just go ahead. I will even smile with you. As we continue through the paper, Another riveting article draws us into the Senate Crime Committee hearings, where Mrs. Orita Yelverton Carroll, the former wife of Martin Accardo, provides a detailed and damning testimony. Surrounded by a tense atmosphere, she reveals incriminating details about the mob's financial stake in Harry Toyler's pro-gambling Morning Mail newspaper. Her statements directly refute Toyler's own testimony exposing deep connections to figures like Tony Accardo and uncovering evidence of organised crime's reach into media and public opinion. The testimony, filled with personal accounts, questionable loans and implications of perjury, lays bare the dangerous alliances threading through Miami's underworld. The atmosphere in the Senate chamber was tense as Mrs. Orita Yelverton Carroll took the stand flanked by security, while the cameras were warned to stay off her. Downey Rice, calm but razor-sharp, began. Your address, please? Rice asked. 7,335 Southwest 39th Terrace, Mrs. Carroll replied in a steady voice. Rice nodded. You were previously married to Martin Accardo, were you not? That's correct. He also went by the name Leo Martin, didn't he? At times, she admitted. Rice leaned in. And when were you married to him? Back in 1944. And where were you working when you met him? Rice asked, his tone probing. I was working at the club he bought in Cicero. That's how we met. The Circle Club? Yes. Rice tilted his head, zeroing in on her. When you were married to him... Was his business running that club? Yes. 
Can you name some people who frequented the Circle Club? Rice asked. I'll give you some names. You tell me if you remember seeing them there. Was Louis Little New York Campagna a regular? Mrs. Carroll stiffened slightly. I'd rather not answer that, she said carefully. Rice's eyes gleamed. What type of business was conducted there, Mrs. Carroll? She hesitated before replying. It was a cocktail lounge. But in the back, it was a gambling room. They took bets on horse races, a bookie operation. And you'd rather not identify the clientele? She relented. If you name some, I'll see what I can tell you. Rice ticked off the names, one by one, each carrying the weight of notoriety. Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik, Tony Accardo, Martin Accardo, Joe Fischetti, Robert Fischetti, Matthew Capone and his wife, Tony Constantino. Mrs. Carroll's lips tightened. They were all there, she said, her tone resigned. Rice glanced at his notes, the gears turning in his head. Did Martin Accardo invest in Harry Toyler's newspaper? She looked down briefly before meeting his gaze. Yes, sir, he did. How much did he invest? Mrs. Carroll's eyes flickered. Various sums, at different times. When did he start handing over money? Rice asked. Three or four days before the paper opened, she replied. By then, he'd already given him $50,000. Did he give more after that? Yes, he did. Rice leaned forward, pressing his advantage. In total, how much did he invest? When I stopped keeping track, it was close to 100000 I believe the agreement was for $125,000. Rice nodded, his tone measured. So he agreed to invest 125000 in Oliver Publishing Company? Did he actually give that amount? I know he invested close to 100000 she said each word punctuated with a quiet finality. In the charged silence that followed, the room seemed to hold its collective breath, digesting the implications of her revelations. Senator O'Connor took the floor, his gaze fixed on Mrs. Carroll, peeling back layer after layer of her involvement with Harry Toyler and Martin Accardo. Can you identify the man who just left the stand? he asked. Mrs. Carroll nodded. Yes, he is Harry Toyler. And did he actually receive the money? Yes, sir, she replied, her voice steady. O'Connor leaned in, probing further. In what form was it given? All in cash. O'Connor's eyebrow lifted slightly. And what consideration did Martin Accardo receive for putting up that money? Mrs. Carroll took a breath. Promissory notes, dated January 1st. 1950. O'Connor nodded, keeping the question sharp. Did Martin Accardo receive any other promises from Mr. Toyler or the Oliver Publishing Company? No, she said. The initial agreement was that he'd invest $50,000 and become a half-owner of the paper. But $50,000 did not last long after the paper opened. I remember an incident with the linotype machines. He had to borrow money for those too. And Mr. Ricardo kept funding everything. Payroll, operations, you name it. Did you ever receive any of that money back? O'Connor asked, voice cold. Not to my knowledge. O'Connor folded his hands. Is Martin Ricardo related to Tony Ricardo? Yes, he is. Did Martin receive any promises regarding the editorial or news reporting policy of the paper? Mrs. Carroll's face grew serious. I can't say for certain. The only time I brought it up was when Frank Costello was in town. Mr. Toyler wrote a favourable editorial about him. I mentioned it. But he brushed it off, didn't want to discuss it. Did he say why? No, but I thought it was reckless. Mr. Ricardo never discussed policy with Toyler. O'Connor pressed on. That editorial ran January 28, 1950, correct? I don't remember the exact date. 
Rice jumped in, his tone more pointed. Why did you object to favourable publicity for Costello? Mrs. Carroll's face grew tight. Because any publicity, whatever it stands for, reflects on my children. I didn't know Toiler's policies at first, but I quickly figured it out and had concerns. And what did you learn about his policies? I can't say exactly, but he was clearly pro-gambling, underhanded about everything. I overheard phone calls, conversations in the office. Rice leaned forward. Did these conversations suggest that the newspaper supported gambling and gangsters? Everything pointed to that. Did it seem like Martin Ocado took an interest in the paper to control it? No. Toiler ran the paper. Mr. Ocado financed it, but he never saw the books. Toiler was the one pushing to get Tony Ocado involved. Rice's brow furrowed. How so? He wanted me to ask Tony for help getting to advertise from theatres and nightclubs. The paper wasn't getting the advertising he expected, and he was spending a lot to keep it afloat. So he wanted Tony to pressure advertisers. That's right. And how would Tony do that? Rice's tone was edging toward incredulity. Mrs. Carroll didn't miss a beat. He had connections. Connections with the union? Yes, she said. The union for movie house employees. Tony could influence them to push ads in the morning mail. Rice continued, relentless. Did Toiler ever ask Tony Ocado directly for money? Not that I know of. To my knowledge, they never even met. Did he approach Murray Humphreys for funds? Mrs. Carroll nodded. He mentioned he had. Rice didn't let up. And when the paper ran into financial trouble, did Toiler go back to Ocado for more? He didn't need to. Mr. Ocado was always there. Watching over his investment? Exactly. Watching Toiler spend his money, she replied coolly. You were worried about those $100,000, weren't you? That money was supposed to be in a trust for my children, she said, her voice finally cracking. That's how I got involved in the newspaper. I insisted on some security, because that was the agreement when we divorced. Rice leaned back, satisfied. And that's when you got that paper, this promissory note. Yes, she said quietly. That's when I insisted on it. The room sat in silence as Mrs. Carroll's final words hung in the air, a stark reminder of the tangled web of money, power and influence threading through the Miami underworld. Senator O'Connor leaned in, a gleam in his eye, as he fixed Mrs. Carroll with a penetrating stare. I just have one question, Mrs. Carroll. You were seated in the third row while Mr. Toiler was testifying. Did you hear what he said about that document? Was it true or false? Mrs. Carroll's reply was swift and resolute. False. O'Connor's gaze sharpened. Was that perjured testimony? Every word of it, she answered without hesitation. Rice resumed his questioning, his tone sharp. You said his testimony was false. Could you specify in what way? Every word he said about my presence there, she replied. Everything he said about that paper is absolutely false. Everything? Rice pressed. Yes, she confirmed, her tone steady. And his statements about the sources of money for financing the paper? False. All of it. Rice didn't skip a beat. While you were married to Ocado, were you known as Mrs. Martin Ocado? Yes. Did you ever go by Mrs. Leo Martin? Never. Rice nodded, digging deeper. And how was Martin Ocado generally known? As Martin Ocado, she answered. He only used Leo Martin when he travelled or didn't want people knowing who he was. Rice's voice softened, but his questions were no less pointed. Were you present when Toiler spoke with Ocado? Yes, she replied. They met in my home. That's where I was introduced to him. And what did Toiler call Martin Ocado? 
He called him Marty, she explained. But socially, he'd introduce him as Leo Martin. Rice's brow furrowed. Did you ever hear him refer to him as Ocado? No. But he knew him as Ocado, didn't he? Yes. Mr. Toiler knows very well that Leo Martin is Martin Ocado. It's been in the papers for years. There's no way he didn't know. Rice raised an eyebrow. Did you ever see Ocado carry a firearm? Yes, he owned two, she said. What did they look like? One was large, the other small, with a pearl handle. And did he carry it with him here in Florida? Yes, sometimes, she replied. Rice turned to Senator O'Connor. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into evidence an FBI record showing Martin Ocado's arrest on November 16, 1931, on a prohibition charge. He was sentenced to four and a half years and fined $1,500, serving two years in Leavenworth, Kansas. Additionally, I'd like to introduce a firearms registration certificate, number 13,560, dated October 31, 1949, issued to Martin Ocado by the Department of Public Safety in Miami, Florida. Senator O'Connor leaned back, his tone shifting as he addressed Mrs. Carroll. Mrs. Carroll, we thank you and Mr. Carroll for your cooperation. As we progress through the paper, it continues to capture the intense scrutiny faced by former Sheriff Jimmy Sullivan and Martin Leo Ocado, a known associate of the Capone mob and the brother of Tony Ocado, as they were cited for contempt by the O'Connor Senate Committee. The proceedings, held in a county courthouse, delve into Sullivan's evasive responses about potentially illicit funds and Martin Ocado's outright refusal to testify. The hearing also pulls in a range of colourful characters, from Sullivan's wife, Ethel, and the former publisher, Harry Voiler, to mob affiliates and public figures, shedding light on the pervasive influence of organised crime in Florida and exposing connections between political figures, narcotics and gambling interests. Former Sheriff Jimmy Sullivan and Martin Leo Ocado, notorious Capone mob figure, faced contempt of Congress charges on Thursday for refusing to answer questions posed by the O'Connor Senate Committee on Interstate Crime. The committee also announced it was considering contempt charges against Sullivan's wife, Ethel, and was recommending perjury charges be filed against Harry Voiler, publisher of the defunct Miami Beach Morning Mail. These were the highlights of a day and evening session in the fourth floor circuit courtroom at the county courthouse. Sessions were scheduled to resume at 9.30 in the morning with a probable focus on narcotics trafficking. The committee stated that Sullivan would be cited for his persistent refusal to answer questions pertinent to tracing large sums of money that might reveal a connection to gamblers or impact other aspects of his duties as sheriff. Ocado, they said, would be cited for refusing to answer any questions beyond confirming his name. Mrs. Sullivan's situation arose from her refusal to answer questions in a closed executive session. The committee reported that, although she discussed her Maryland real estate transactions openly and admitted to forging her husband's name on a deed, she would not confirm whether she had given money from the sheriff's 1944 and 1948 campaigns to relatives. Associate Counsel Downey Rice stated that Mrs. Sullivan had admitted taking substantial sums from her husband's campaign funds without his knowledge. These sums totaled approximately $7,500 in 1944 and around $17,000 to $18,000 in 1948. In a little over an hour, in a session held to accommodate her due to illness, she corroborated information that her husband had refused to confirm such as the authenticity of his signature on Maryland deed documents, which she later admitted were forged. Jimmy Sullivan had also declined to disclose his net worth, citing that it could incriminate him regarding his ongoing income tax issues. All testimony pointed to organised crime stronghold over Florida and suggested that Governor Fuller Warren and local prosecutors were doing little to combat it. Chairman Herbert O'Connor, a Maryland Democrat, issued a statement accusing the governor of indifference after Warren missed a noon deadline 
to either appear or provide a reason for not attending the hearing. O'Connor indicated that a subpoena was prepared for immediate service should the committee decide to summon Warren. Witness after witness testified about the influence that Chicago and New York mobs wield over Florida. These witnesses included Martin Leo Accardo, brother of Tony Big Tuna Accardo from the Capone Syndicate, and a 27-year-old woman struggling with drug addiction. Statements and silences alike conveyed that criminal influence had seeped into Florida's racing industry, the operation of Voila's Miami Beach paper, and, by implication, drug trafficking through the United States mail system from Chicago and New York. Should the committee pursue perjury charges against Voila, it must request the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida to file and prosecute them. These charges would stem from Voila's alleged false testimony, claiming he received no funding for his newspaper from Martin Accardo. Voila's former wife, Orita Yelverton Carroll, testified that her ex-husband, a mother of three, had contributed nearly $100,000 to Voila's Morning Mail, which ceased publication after 41 issues in 1950. She mentioned that this money should have gone into a trust fund for their two children. A.D. Hubbard, attorney for missing gambler Raymond Craig, testified that he travelled to Chicago with Craig in 1949 in an attempt to garner support from the governor's friend W. H. Johnston for Craig's proposal to legalise off-track betting. Jack Raskin, a Miami Beach policeman whose wife previously worked for the S&G syndicate, claimed he was unaware of bookmaking's illegality, supposedly due to the lenient policy in Miami Beach. Betty Jane Oswill, a deputy in the former Sheriff Sullivan's office, confirmed that she notarized a signature on a Maryland real estate document, which she now knew had been forged by Mrs. Ethel Sullivan. Mayor Boggs of Hollywood, Florida, was accused of hosting gamblers, including notorious New York mob figure Meyer Lansky, in his home and allegedly receiving money from them. Former Sheriff Jimmy Sullivan, who sweated visibly during his Thursday appearance, mirrored his demeanour from his testimony before the committee last December. This time, however, he appeared to follow the pattern of evasion set by various politicians and other witnesses who had previously testified before the committee. The Crime Committee questioned Sullivan, but he declined to answer many inquiries, citing the now well-known risk of self-incrimination. Jack Kehoe, his attorney, sat behind him, almost literally hovering over him like a mother hen protecting her chick. In fact, Kehoe was so insistent on coming to Sullivan's defence that Chief Counsel Richard Moser eventually had to reprimand him. Every time we ask the witness a question, you jump in like you're answering for him. Moser shot a look at Kehoe. This habit of yours? It's not going to fly here. Kehoe stiffened, but kept quiet. Moser leaned back toward Sullivan, fixing his gaze. So, do you fear criminal prosecution under the tax laws for a fraudulent income tax return? Sullivan shifted in his seat, and after a beat replied, I'm not sure the question is worded right. Then, phrase it right, Moser challenged. Silence. Sullivan squirmed again, looking down as if the answers might somehow be etched on the floor. He seemed to search his memory, or pretended to, when Moser's questions about a strange collect call he'd received from Grady McWhorter came up. McWhorter, that slippery character, had testified in Tallahassee in front of the Haley Senate Committee, boasting connections to everyone from Sheriff Sullivan to the Greater Miami Crime Commission, and even one Raymond Craig. Allegedly, he'd tried framing Dan Sullivan with a wiretap. Moser pressed on. What was that call about? Sullivan's shoulders hunched. Mr. Chairman, I swear, I don't remember what it was about. Do you recall the call at all? Moser's tone sharpened. A phone call, a telegram, something like that, it's a blur. It was only two months ago, and it wasn't a cheap call. We're sure you might recall it. Moses' patience was unravelling. A long pause stretched between them until Sullivan muttered, 
Maybe it was about his wife. Could have been. Or maybe he asked me to tell her he'd be back soon. Moses' eyes narrowed. Who delivered this supposed message? I think, Carl Holloway. And why you, of all people? Sullivan scratched his head, avoiding Moses' stare. He worked for me. Said he had info for me. He'd pick up things, you know. Moser shot back. So, you took a collect call from Michigan in your own home? Well, the sheriff gets calls from all over. Some I decline, some I take. Moser was relentless. When was the last time you saw McWhorter? Sullivan looked defeated. When he got back from Michigan, I think. He came by the office, can't remember why. The room shifted as Kehoe, Sullivan's lawyer, stood, asking Chairman O'Connor to forbid photos of his client. The chairman agreed, but the moment passed, and Moses' questioning rolled on. When they circled back to Sullivan's finances, it was clear Moser smelled blood. Your full name is James Alexander Sullivan. Yes, Moser didn't miss a beat. So, you've testified before, and you spoke about property you purchased. Remember that? Before Sullivan could answer, Kehoe interjected, objecting that any questions on property were off-limits, as they tied into Sullivan's net worth. Unfazed, Moser pressed, Let me ask you, who is Carvel Ford? Sullivan hesitated. He's my wife's uncle, or, well, maybe a half-brother of her father. Moser leaned forward. And he's dead now? Yes. Did you buy any property from him? Kehoe jumped in again, objecting. But Sullivan leaned over, visibly uneasy, and muttered, I refuse to answer. My taxes, they're being investigated. My hands are tied here. O'Connor, exasperated, nodded. The committee directs that you answer. You're still refusing. Yes, sir. Moser shifted in his chair, drilling into Sullivan's composure. Does your refusal to answer involve others, or is it just you? Sullivan opened his mouth, closed it, and finally muttered, I don't know how to answer that. The questions rolled on, Moser pushing, Sullivan dodging. Each time Kehoe's hand would go up, objecting, as Moser repeated, We'll get our answers one way or another. By the time they returned to the subject of taxes, the pressure was palpable. O'Connor leaned in, determined. Mr. Sullivan, did you file a supplementary return? Sullivan straightened. Yes. And when was that? Prior to the last Senate hearing. So, July? Sullivan glanced at his lawyer, hesitating, before answering with a stiff nod. Then, just as Moser thought he'd broken through, Kehoe, like clockwork, raised his objection again. Sullivan's voice grew softer, defensive, until O'Connor finally sighed and wrapped up the session, watching as Sullivan shuffled out, leaving unanswered questions in his wake. The courtroom sat still, as if everyone was holding a collective breath, wondering just how many secrets would stay buried under Sullivan's deflections. There was further debate on this issue, and his attorney then advised Sullivan not to answer, which he ultimately refused. Perjury was committed, said a Capone hoodlum's attractive blonde ex-wife, when Harry Toyler testified to the Senate Crime Committee about the financial arrangements under which his now-defunct daily newspaper briefly operated at Miami Beach. Toyler's testimony about that and other matters follows. Moser leaned in, his gaze fixed on Toyler with a sharp intensity. Are you familiar with the banquet held at the restaurant in your hotel for the benefit of Barry College? Moser asked. Toyler didn't flinch. I was the chairman. And who paid for the banquet? I did, Toyler replied, keeping his voice steady. Moser arched an eyebrow. You paid for it out of your own pocket? Yes, sir. Moser gave a faint nod letting that hang for a moment before pulling a piece of paper from his file. I see. The committee's previous findings include a check, 
payable by the S&G Syndicate. It's marked for your restaurant, the Trocadero, with a note that says, For entertainment of Barry College, with funds furnished by the S&G Syndicate, arranged by William Burbridge, Miami Beach Councilman. Sound about right. Toiler's face tightened. He was the co-chairman, he admitted. So Burbridge supplied the money. He supplied the money, Toiler confirmed, his tone clipped. Moser leaned forward. That's what the check says too, and it came straight from the S&G syndicate, didn't it? Toiler's voice grew defensive. I couldn't answer that. Barry College got $7,500, $6,000 in donations, and the Trocadero kicked in $1,500 from our receipts that night. Moser narrowed his eyes. Why did the S&G syndicate contribute money to that dinner? I couldn't answer that question, Toiler said quickly, his tone starting to fray. Moser didn't blink. Did the S&G syndicate contribute any money to the Palm Court Hotel? Toiler's lips pressed into a thin line. For what purpose? Moser didn't break his gaze. I'm asking if it ever paid any money. The S&G never paid, Toiler shot back, a flash of irritation in his eyes. I have a tenant by the name of Charlie Friedman, but why are you asking me this? The S&G syndicate never paid any money. Moser leaned back, allowing a brief unsettling silence to settle over the room. Moser settled in, his eyes locked on Toiler, ready to dig deeper. You are the sole owner of the stock of the Oliver Publishing Company, aren't you? Moser asked. Toiler nodded, tight-lipped. Yes, sir. And it was organized to publish a paper called The Morning Mail. That right? Yes. And that was set up in the fall of 1949? Yes, sir. Moser leaned in, an eyebrow raised. Did the newspaper have its own building and equipment? Yes, sir. And what did that building run you? Seventy thousand dollars, Toiler replied, shifting in his seat. And the equipment? Moser pressed. Forty-nine thousand. Bought it in Washington, D.C. Moser's eyes narrowed, not letting up. So, where'd you get the seventy thousand for the building? Or did the corporation pay for it? Toiler gave a quick shake of his head. I didn't buy that building. Then the corporation did? No, sir. Moses' jaw tightened. Who owned the building then? Mrs. Louise L. Toiler. Your wife. So where did she get $70,000 to buy it? Toiler cleared his throat, looking a little uncomfortable. You'd have to ask her that. Moser didn't miss a beat. But she doesn't have an income, does she? No, sir. None at all. And yet, she had $70,000 lying around. How about that? I couldn't say, Toiler mumbled. Moser's voice turned sharp. Should we call Mrs. Toiler to testify? If you wish, Toiler replied, almost defiantly. You think she'll tell us where she got it? Toiler's voice wavered just slightly. Yes, I do. Then why don't you just tell us now? Moser demanded. At this point, Senator O'Connor broke in. Why don't you answer the question? You said you wanted to cooperate. Why don't you start by telling the truth? Toiler bristled, his face red. Mr. Chairman, I object to the insinuation that I'm not being truthful. Moser picked right back up. I'm just asking for the truth, Mr. Toiler. Toiler glared at him. I object to you accusing me of falsehoods. Moser held his ground. Then answer the question. Where did your wife get the $70,000? Toiler's frustration was showing. She didn't pay $70,000. She only bought it for that much. Doesn't mean it was cash. Moser's voice didn't soften. How much cash? Did she put down? Twenty thousand, Toiler replied, voice clipped. And where did she get that cash? She may have drawn it out of the Palm Court Hotel or sold some jewellery.
Toiler hedged. Moses' gaze was unrelenting. What did she do? Don't say May. What did she do? Toiler looked cornered. I think I gave her a check originally for 7,500. Your money? Moser asked, pressing. Our money, Toiler snapped. We've been married 25 years. Our money's one and the same. Moser leaned back, letting the silence build before he went on. I asked how much you paid, and you said you didn't buy it, your wife did. Then, you said, it's both of your money. So, where did you get the $20,000 you used to buy that building? Toiler's face hardened. Would it satisfy you to know that I owe $143,500 in mortgages recorded in Dade County? Did anyone else contribute toward the purchase of that building? Toiler's answer was firm. Definitely not. After long, grueling questioning, Moser managed to ring out that the remaining 50000 was paid off in 1951, when the company went under. And as he dug deeper into the morning mail's shaky finances, a new name surfaced. The woman from Coral Gables. When Moser pressed, Toiler finally acknowledged her. Mrs. Yelverton, he admitted. Mrs. Oretta Yelverton Carroll. She's the ex-wife of Martin Accardo. A shift in the room. Moser seized on the revelation. Did the Oliver Company sign a note payable to Mrs. Yelverton? Toiler looked uneasy. She said she had a friend interested in investing. I asked how much. She said it didn't matter. So, I mentioned $125,000. I said I'd sell half the place for that. And did she loan it to you? Toiler hesitated, choosing his words carefully. She asked if I could put that in writing. Said she was serious. So I had the agreement drawn up, had Louise sign it, and handed it over. Moses' voice cut through the tension. So you gave her a promissory note for $125,000, right? I'm holding a promissory note dated January 31st, 1950, signed by Harry O. Toiler and Louise A. Toiler, with Oliver Publishing Corporation as collateral. He paused, letting the weight of the words sink in. Toiler straightened up, indignant. Counsel should read the entire letter. Fairness to me, the witness, demands it. Moser brushed him off. The document is entered into evidence. You've made your explanation. Toiler's eyes narrowed. It's in there that the stock was collateral. Counsel conveniently left that out. Moser didn't even blink. The letter reads... It is further agreed that 50 shares of stock of Oliver Publishing Corporation shall be put up as collateral for Mrs. Yelverton, as further good faith on the part of Harry and Louise Toiler and Oliver Publishing Corporation. That's what you wanted, isn't it? Toiler gave a tight nod. Yes. Moser leaned forward, voice low and cold. Did you get $125,000? No. Moser held up a photo. This picture, taken at the morning mail's opening. Recognize yourself? Toiler nodded. Yes. And Louis Shafkin? Yes. Martin Accardo, also known as Leo Martin? Yes. And Mrs. Aretta Yelverton, standing right next to Leo Martin? Yes. Was she married to him then? Toiler shifted uncomfortably. I couldn't say. Moser eyed him. Around the time your paper hit financial trouble, wasn't there a robbery next door to Shafkin's store? Toiler's face turned red. Mr. Chairman, it's time counsel was admonished for these questions. Moses' eyes glinted as he finally dismissed Toiler with a cold, You're excused. Probers dug deeply into the career and associations of Harry Toiler, former publisher of the now defunct Morning Mail during a Senate committee session on Thursday. The former publisher, with sagging eyes and interlaced fingers, sat quietly as the probing continued. One of Toiler's angels in the publication was racketeer Martin Accardo. The committee was informed by Accardo's former wife. 
the record highlighted connections to racketeering and other criminal activities. This article goes on to expose the murky underbelly of Hollywood's political and gambling landscape. Witnesses in the Senate Crime Committee hearings recount suspicious activities surrounding Mayor Boggs, linking him to notorious gamblers, including Jake Lansky. Testimonies describe bribes, sacks filled with money, and threats issued by Lansky himself. The gripping revelations depict a city under the shadow of organized crime, where bribes and threats attempt to silence opposition, and powerful figures seem entangled in a network of corruption and covert dealings. Brief but revealing glimpses of gambling operations in Hollywood were presented during the Senate Crime Committee's session on Thursday night. The hearing provided insights into the presence of notorious gamblers, seen moving in and out of Mayor Boggs's home with sacks that appeared to be filled with money. The session ended without a full account, but witnesses described secretive meetings between Boggs and known gamblers at the mayor's hog farm, and detailed an alleged $25,000 bribe offered by Jake Lansky to a local activist. The testimony painted Boggs as the antagonist, with former city tax assessor Lee A. Wentworth as the central witness. Wentworth described the efforts of a citizen's group to shut down gambling operations, which, according to him, ran openly during Boggs' seven terms as mayor, but were reduced to covert operations during the two years Boggs served as a city commissioner. Wentworth initially sought the help of Hollywood Police Chief Phil Thompson, who reportedly responded, I'm not the one who opened those places, so I'll have to speak to whoever did. With no action from Thompson, Wentworth took his concerns to Sheriff Walter Clark, who dismissed the issue, claiming it was merely a little bookie business, nothing wide open. Wentworth also wrote a letter to Governor Fuller Warren, asking for intervention, but received no reply. Frustrated, Wentworth pursued a court injunction on his own to shut down the gambling establishments. Then, one night in September 1949, a black Cadillac pulled up outside his home. A local attorney invited him to the car, where he met Jake Lansky. Lansky asked, Don't you think you have taken on more than you can handle? Wentworth replied that he could handle it. Lansky then offered, Would you be interested in $25,000? Wentworth responded, Yes, but I'm more interested in my life. That conversation ended there. But a few nights later, another car with several men arrived this time bringing a large shoebox they claimed contained $25,000. They warned Wentworth he had two choices, a silver bullet or a silver dollar. Wentworth went inside to retrieve his gun, telling them he would count to five before shooting. The men quickly left. David Mears, a Hollywood plumbing contractor and member of the Citizens Group, testified that he frequently saw gamblers visiting Mayor Boggs's home. As a result of his stance against gambling, his license to install septic tanks was revoked, though it was later reinstated with no apparent conditions attached. Homer Austin, a labourer and former employee of Boggs, testified that he saw gamblers at Boggs' home, including one named Jiggs Farrell, who entered the house carrying a sack that seemed to contain money. Austin recounted overhearing discussions about distributing money and was told by a gambler called Goldie that he paid off Boggs every Monday. Another former employee of Boggs, Thomas J. Attaway of Hollywood, who lived directly across the street from the mayor, testified that he also saw known gamblers visiting the Boggs residence and witnessed the meeting with the mayor at his hog farm, often carrying sacks that seemed to contain paper money. When Senator Herbert O'Connor asked if the sack could have contained paper money, the witness confirmed, yes. Austin also testified that while Boggs claimed support for gubernatorial candidate Dan McCarty, he threw a barbecue for Governor Fuller Warren at his hog farm. The session then concluded, with O'Connor announcing it would resume today at 10 in the morning, though he did not confirm if the Hollywood gambling story would continue. On Thursday night, Mayor Boggs dismissed the accusations, calling his accusers 
disgruntled former city employees and defeated candidates, and categorically denying the allegations. He expressed a willingness to be subpoenaed by the committee to allow them to investigate his record. Boggs admitted he knew Lansky, Farrell and others mentioned in the testimony, but claimed it was merely because they had lived in Hollywood for many years, and this is a small town where everybody knows everybody. He denounced the allegations of bribery as a bunch of lies. Wentworth sat back, his voice calm but edged with a quiet defiance. He had told this story countless times, yet every retelling felt as urgent as the first. What action did you take to address the gambling operations? asked the counsel, his pen hovering over the notepad. Wentworth didn't miss a beat. I brought evidence straight to Chief Phil Thompson, he replied. Asked him to shut down the gambling joints. The counsel leaned in. And what did he say? A wry smile crossed Wentworth's face as he recalled the chief's words. He said, I'm not the one who opened them up, so I'll have to talk to whoever did. He paused, letting the sarcasm linger in the air. Not exactly the response I was hoping for. Did you complain to anyone else? Sure, Wentworth nodded. I went to the sheriff next. Who was the sheriff at that time? Walter Clark, he said with a hint of disdain. The man who liked to pretend there wasn't a problem. And what did he say? He just shrugged it off. Said it was just a little booky business. Nothing wide open, you know. Wentworth shook his head, reliving his frustration. Like, that was supposed to make it all right. The council pressed on, his tone shifting as if sensing there was more. Did you take any further steps? Yeah, I did, Wentworth replied. I sent a telegram to Governor Fuller Warren, hoping someone up the chain would listen. Did you get a response? Wentworth gave a dry laugh. Not even an acknowledgement. Nothing. Did you follow up? Sent him a letter, laid out every concern we had. But, just like the telegram, not a word back. The council exchanged a glance with his assistant, then looked back at Wentworth. Did you and your associates take any other action? Only thing left to do, we filed for court injunctions, he said, a trace of satisfaction in his voice. We went after them ourselves. And what happened? Three locations got hit. Deluxe, Alhalla and Jiggs Farrell's place. They all shut down after we got the injunctions. The council raised his eyebrows. Were they actually closed? Oh yes, Wentworth nodded, relishing the memory. We shut those places down. The council paused, choosing his next question carefully. Did anyone contact you about the gambling after the injunctions were in place? Wentworth leaned back, his expression darkening. Not after, but during. I had a visitor, around eight o'clock, late August or early September, maybe. This local attorney, Joe Varon, showed up at my door, asking me to come out to his car. And did you? Yeah, Wentworth replied, his voice dropping a notch. When I got to the car, I saw who he had with him, Jake Lansky himself. The room fell silent. The council's pen hovered motionless. And what did Lansky say? Wentworth's voice was steady. He asked, Don't you think you've taken on more than you can handle? I told him I thought I could handle it just fine. The council's eyes narrowed. Did he offer you anything? He did. Twenty-five thousand dollars to drop the injunctions. Wentworth's gaze was unyielding. I turned him down. The council gave a slight nod, signalling for him to continue. Wentworth drew a deep breath. A few nights later, three more men showed up with a shoebox. Said it was $25,000. Told me I had a choice. A silver bullet or a silver dollar. The council's gaze sharpened. What did you do? I went inside, got my gun, 
and told them I'd count to five. Then I'd start shooting. He let a grin slip. They didn't stay to find out if I meant it. The council cleared his throat, letting the weight of the testimony sink in. Now, let's move on. David Mears, another witness, testified that he knew several gamblers connected with Mayor Boggs, including Lansky, A.B. Mellons, Jesse Mellons, Al Cordell, Farrell, and Al Peterson. He turned to Mears, a Hollywood plumbing contractor with a rough demeanor and quick eyes. Mears, have you ever seen Jake Lansky, Al Cordell, Jiggs Farrell, or A.B. Wellens at the mayor's house? asked the council. Mears shrugged, shifting in his chair. Yeah, I've seen Wellens there plenty of times, between 1948 and 1950. Saw Lansky there too, a few times in 47, 48 and 49. And did you ever see Lansky go inside? Yeah, once, he replied as if it were no big deal. Saw him go right in. And what about Jiggs Farrell? The council continued, glancing down at his notes. Seen him around here and there. And Al Cordell. Cordell? Sure. Seen him in the yard a few times. Homer Austin, a labourer from West Hollywood who once worked for Boggs, leaned forward. His voice was gravelly and low. How do you know these people, Mr. Austin? asked the council. Austin scratched his chin. I gambled with them at their places. Did you ever see them at Bog's house? Austin gave a single nod. Every week. The council eyed him closely. Did you see any money there? Austin's eyes narrowed as he remembered. Saw Jiggs Farrell with a sack in 1948. Heard him counting money. The final witness, Thomas Attaway a Hollywood truck driver who lived across the street from Boggs, stepped forward. He had also worked for the mayor. Mr. Attaway, did you see any of these gamblers at Boggs' house? asked the council. All of them, Attaway replied simply, all the time when I worked for Boggs. And did Boggs ever visit any of these men? Attaway smirked. Yeah, took a sack of money from Al Cordell's car once, out at his hog farm. The council's voice lowered, as if he was saving the most damning question for last. Did Boggs ever mention loaning money to any of these gamblers? Attaway's gaze darkened. Yeah, he said slowly. Told me he loaned Papa Joe $12,000 to cover a mortgage. The council's voice was barely a whisper now, and the room seemed to lean in. Did Boggs mention his connection to Governor Warren? Attaway nodded. Said he was for Dan McCarty, but he threw a big barbecue for Warren during the campaign. The silence hung heavy in the room, each witness's words thick with the kind of truth that cuts deep. 